Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here and welcome back. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend just a couple of minutes on chapter 12, which is Manifest Destiny. And we're in this time period in the first half of the 1800s. So we're still before the Civil War. And I think most of you know what antebellum is, the antebellum era, but antebellum means before the war. So when you read about that term or hear about it, you know it means before the Civil War. And, um, you know, we're rapidly coming to a close here because our class ends at the Civil War. That's sort of the first half of American history. And we've spent a lot of time in the early 1800s. So we looked at market revolution, this time of expanding economy and expanding business, expanding infrastructure, really, with the Erie Canal and, and new means of transport to get goods across the country, uh, particularly agricultural goods. And then we also uh, looked at the Jacksonian era, this, this time when Andrew Jackson gets into office, and there's sort of this new populism. In other words, the country begins to find an identity that isn't just defined by the old East Coast elites, the, fine, the founding fathers, if you will. So with Andrew Jackson, those days are kind of over with. And if you remember from the Jackson uh, um, a lecture and discussion and chapter that Jackson, Jackson su shuts down the second bank of the United States, the National Bank, and that's eventually going to get the country into big financial trouble with the Panic of 1837. And the other thing that's happening that we read about in the last chapter was the uh, Second Great Awakening, which was this uh, sort of religious fervor going on at the same time with a lot of uh, building of churches and the Mormons moving out west and the Presbyterian movement and the evangelical movement. So there's a lot of things going on at the same time. And I think as a historian, it's sort of indicative of the country finding its own footing and establishing a certain American culture. Now, with that in mind, chapter 12, which is entitled Manifest Destiny, is part of that culture, this idea that it's our destiny as Americans, and particularly then as white Americans, to uh, control this, this country from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific. And, and this idea, this framework that, that we need to be the dominant player, not only in what is the United States now, but also in the entire hemisphere, uh, really manifests itself in the Monroe Doctrine. So you remember we covered the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine, which basically said that, that we're the policemen of uh, the Western Hemisphere. And uh, then also, you know, prior to that, the Louisiana Purchase. So again, this notion of purchasing all the land because we deserve it and it's our destiny to have it. So, so this chapter expands with that idea of manifest destiny. And there's, a, there's some cool historical evidence to the way people were thinking about that at the time. So uh, there's the Hudson River School, which is a, a not an art school, but a, a genre of art, if you will. And, and a lot of the paintings out of this time show these expanses of an idyllic countryside with some wilderness, but also being tamed by uh, white Americans, taking the wilderness and turning it into productive farmland, this uh, agrarian uh, dream that, that really came from Thomas Jefferson, this idea that this country was special and that we were civilized and that we were going to make it more productive than it was in the past. So, so when we think of Manifest Destiny, we think of this idea of you know, white European American settlers uh, coming in and making improvements to the land. Now, the other part of Manifest Destiny, especially as we're talking about the 1830s and 1840s, is we didn't have all the land, so the country was nothing like it is now. At that time, um, you know, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Arizona, those were not part of the plan. Those were west of the Louisiana Purchase, and that was not territory that we had. And even the Oregon Territory, which would include uh, Oregon and Washington, uh, Washington State, you know, those weren't uh, platted or by any means possessions, sole possessions of the United States at that time. So, so all of that property out west was uh, free property. Now, there were a lot of Native Americans out there. And as you know, after the Jacksonian era, there were a lot of Native Americans moved out to Oklahoma. Uh, Texas wasn't a state yet at the beginning of this chapter, but Texas becomes annexed. Uh, it belongs to Mexico, but Mexico really kind of makes a mistake, I think. They, they want to build up 
uh, Texas as a buffer between the U.S. and Mexico and invite a lot of American immigrants into Texas who eventually take over uh, with slaves. And there's this idea amongst American settlers in Texas that Texas should be uh, a separate republic or at least a republic of the United States and it should be a slave republic at that. So there's that part going on in Texas. While all of this land stuff is getting sorted out, the abolition movement is growing in the north because slavery is very controversial. So it seems like a lot is going on and, and there certainly is. Now one point I want to make um, in the 1840s uh, President Polk is in office and he starts the Mexican-American War basically uh, with the backing from a lot of the uh, a lot of his constituents and so it's it's in 1848 1847 1848 the Treaty of um, um, uh, Guadalupe Hildago I'm sorry is signed and basically the US uh, beats Mexico in the Mexican War, and we take those states. So we take California, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Utah, and so the country really expands after that. And and the reason it's important to know that is because you know that western area is is sort of new, and it, there's not anybody out there at this point in time. And and so we're talking 1848. The transcontinental railroad wouldn't be built until 1869. So there's, uh, there's no settlement out west at all. During this period of time, after the Oregon Territory is, is settled and really becomes a possession of the U.S., and after all of those western states become uh, territories of the U.S., there's this great migration out west. And you've all seen the, you know, the Conestoga wagons, the pioneers traveling out west, and this was not an easy thing to do. So even if you left, uh, say, today's Iowa, uh, or you were on the Mississippi River and you wanted to go out to the Oregon coast uh, or the California coast by, uh, uh, by you know, in a wagon train, you know, it could take you up to six months to do that. So now you can get to the Pacific coast in three, four days by car. So, uh, and three, four hours by plane, of course. But anyway, it was a, a big undertaking. And the point is that during the 1840s and 1850s, uh, there is a lot of expansion out west. Now, this does a couple of things. It, it certainly starts to crowd out the Native Americans more so, so that's going to become an issue. Uh, and there's some other uh, natural resource issues, so the bison and the buffalo of the Great Plains start to get wiped out, uh, sometimes just for sport, sometimes to rob the Native Americans of their resources, which uh, they counted on bison for, for food and, and shelter and, and other resources. So. There's that going on. Uh, that's kind of a big deal. In politics, there are a lot of things going on at the same time. So there's the Democratic Party and there's the National Republic Party and their Republican Party, and they're totally different than the parties are today. And the National Republican Party starts to fracture and turns into the Whig Party. And so the Whigs, the W-H-I-G, all right, Whig, they have a real presence in politics in the 1840s and a actually Abraham Lincoln originally um, uh, was a Whig so there is this kind of fracturing of the political parties which which we still see today or at least we see talk of it we hear talk of the Republican Party fracturing under Trump and and even some Bernie Sanders Democrats so we see these these minor factions or talk of it in the media but but back in the 1830s 1840s it was real I mean the the Whig Party uh, really had candidates out there and and uh, you know but the but the issues were the same the parties different uh, differences or or you know what um, what they fought was or what they debated really was how much power uh, should the federal government have and how much power should the states have. So states' rights, of course, are going to become an issue when we get into the Civil War and when we get into slavery. States' rights versus, uh, you know, national or, or federalism, if you will. So um, the point is that, that in Chapter 12 there's a lot of stuff going on, and I think that um, the big takeaways as far as what I'd like you to remember, because I know you won't remember the details when class is over, but I'd like you to know what Manifest Destiny is because I think as a modern superpower, 
um, we've sort of redefined this notion of manifest destiny, not just to include the geography between the Atlantic and the Pacific, but, but maybe global geography, whether it's uh, our dominance uh, um, as a superpower uh, in Europe and, and, uh, or, or in Asia or, or wherever we sort of flex our muscles to, to try to be the policeman of the world. It's certainly a, a something that's related to this notion of manifest destiny. And so remember manifest destiny, if you would. You should know what the antebellum era is, at least, so you know, remember that's before the war. And um, also think about this expansion westward because as we gain those territories from Mexico, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes along with it. And not only does it open up the debates about slavery, are the states in the West going to be slave states or not? It also greatly expands our economy, and that's not going to happen until the 1870s um, when mining starts in Colorado and when California starts to grow. But there's this big economic expansion going on at the same time. So there's a lot of stuff here. Um, the other thing you should keep in mind, so I already talked about Manifest Destiny, but a takeaway from this chapter is, you know, think about race and think about racial, racial issues today. And, and Manifest Destiny was largely defined by race, this idea that, that white Americans, you know, deserve, um, you know, through some religious uh, providence, we deserve this, this landmass. And that was sort of the, the thought at the time. And, and think about how that relates to uh, racial controversies today and um, um, the fears of the other, if you will, so Native Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, certainly that's still in the news today. So some of these things are still going on, you know, well more than 100 years later. So it's kind of inter interesting to see that, that notions of manifest destiny and notions of, of race, um, you know, this is a history that's still playing itself out right now all this time afterwards. So that's it. Enjoy chapter 12. There's a lot there. Uh, be safe, and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.